Okay, so in this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about the Adobe Photoshop preferences. So to load those up, all you have to do is go to Photoshop, Preferences, General, or Control K, or Command K on the Mac, which I'm on a Mac here, so it's going to be a little different than the PC. Um, the PC, I believe, is under Edit. I think it's like Edit Preferences. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but you should be able to find that pretty easily. So anyway, there's um, we've got some tabs here on the left that take you through all the different preferences that are for Photoshop and we'll kind of go one by one through each one of these um, and I'm just going to sort of just do a quick overview make it short and sweet and not spend too much time on a lot of these these options just because uh, a lot of them are straightforward and you should be able to kind of pick and choose how you want to optimize Photoshop to work for your needs um, so let's just go ahead and get started and the thing about the preferences too, which is really handy, is like if you mouse over any of these um, options, it gives you a tool tip. So I definitely encourage you to look at the tool tips if you're kind of confused or if you need a little bit of more of a description to um, to find out more information about that stuff. Um, totally up to you, but it, it helps a little bit. So anyway, we're talking about uh, the color picker first, which as you know in Photoshop, the color picker is your standard color picker palette that all Adobe applications use. Um, it's set up by default so you can you know sort by your hue and control your saturation or your brightness and um, you know choose your color from there. There's also RGB you've got all these other you know cool little um, like gadgets for you to get get the color that you're looking for. So going back into our preferences you know the Adobe is the default one but then there's the Apple one and depending on your operating system whatever the default operating system um, color picker is that will be an option as well so if we just look at the Apple one really quick we'll see that this is our um, our Apple color picker yeah it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that the Adobe one has but it essentially does the exact same thing is which is allow you to pick a color so um, going back in that's all that's all good so moving on to the HUD color picker which is a new feature in CS5 and they give you a bunch of options here which is the hue strip, hue strip large, hue wheel, hue wheel medium, and hue wheel large. Now even though there's all these options basically there's two of them the hue strip and the hue wheel and they're just displayed at different sizes so let's look at the hue strip first and we'll hit OK. So to access the HUD you need to be in like a brush mode or something that allows you to access the color palette so on the Mac it's control alt and command and then you click oh but I didn't go into the brush mode so there you go brush mode and there you go here's the color strip select your hue get your saturation whatever you want and uh, there you go so going back into the preferences let's take a look at the hue wheel which I think I like a little bit more but let's take a look at it same thing make sure I'm in brush mode this time and here's the wheel. Choose your color, saturation, value, whatever you want to call it, and there you go, which is pretty handy. I find that this is um, like a pretty handy thing, especially if you're painting and you don't want to break your workflow because, you know, before in Photoshop you always have to like move to another color palette or menu to get your color. So this is pretty useful. Okay, moving on, we have image interpolation. And so in Adobe Photoshop, image interpolation just basically means. Um, it's like a calculation or a blend between two values to sort of you know guess a result so it's used a lot for scaling and a lot for um, scaling while you're doing a transform and basically just means how Photoshop is blending the pixels of your image so the default is bicubic which is you know they say best for smooth gradients and there's your tooltip that pops up there telling you that um, and if we look at some of the other options there's bicubic smoother which is best for like enlarging an image um, generally scaling up is a little bit iffy depending on what you're trying to do you try not to scale up but um, anyway if you have to use it I would say go ahead and use this uh, setting or by cubic sharper and which they suggest best for reduction so if you're scaling down you can use that one too generally I use it at by cubic that seems to just work fine for me and I think a lot of people leave this alone um, the only other one that's maybe like noteworthy is maybe nearest neighbor so let's jump out of here really quick and take a look at our image now if we zoom in on our image you could see that it's pretty um, smooth for the mo most part despite some of the noise in the photograph. Um, so let's just go ahead and scale this down using our nearest neighbor 
so image image size and let's bring this down to like 500 so something enough where we see the difference so it scales that down and if we zoom in you can see that all, a lot of our smoothness is gone and everything is kind of really pixelated and kind of chunky so that is a result of nearest neighbor sort of kind of pulling out every other row of pixels and just kind of shoving them together so um, jumping back into the preferences like we're just going to set that back to by cubic and leave it there okay moving on to the options part of this um, I'm just going to go over these really quick and just give you a brief description about each one of them and so the first one is auto update open documents and so that allows Photoshop to recognize that the document is live within Photoshop and if that document gets edited or something gets changed to that same document outside of Photoshop like an Illustrator or another Adobe um, package then when you return to Photoshop it'll recognize that and it'll bring up a prompt saying hey this image was changed do you want to update it pretty simple beep when done that's simple too so if Photoshop is churning away and it have the, displays the status bar and uh, while you're running a filter or whatever basically when it completes it's gonna play a sound and beep so that's useful too dynamic color sliders is essentially gives you the real-time feedback for any slider that is within Photoshop whether it be the hue saturation or levels or whatever um, that gives you a real-time interaction and so this allows you to do that export clipboard um, just means that anything that is copied into the clipboard is available for other applications to use uh, use shift key for tool switch now your toolbox on the side each one of your tools has like a sub tool or there's other options for that tool like the paintbrush um, so if we look at that really quick um, click and hold any of the tools and you'll see that there's a brush tool, pencil tool, and all these other tools underneath all of these. So wherever you see this little triangle in the corner just means you could click and it'll roll out more tools. So that preference um, allows you to use shift to toggle through those tools. So if you click on the brush and do control, or sorry, shift B, you'll see that it's toggling through those tools. So that allows you to do that. Now resize image during place, let me show you an example of that. So if we get out of here and go into file, place, and let's just pick a photo really quick. Um, and I'll grab just uh, some flowers. And uh, say we wanted to place some flowers in this, then we'll go ahead and uh, I guess it's churning. But uh, see how it shows a bounding box and uh, like a transform bounding box? So basically that setting allows you to do this while you're placing it. It by default brings up your bounding box so you can um, you know like shift this around and like scale it to what you want during an image place. So um, I'm not going to wait for that because that's a pretty huge image. But anyway that's what that uh, setting does. So animated zoom is basically cosmetic. It just smooths out your zoom a little bit um, and sort of has a little ease in and ease out while you zoom around. Um, zoom resizes windows. So I'll show you an ex example of that. So right now, um, if you do like control or command plus and minus, you'll see that um, the window size is changing in accordance to the scale of your zoom. So zoom with the scroll wheel I find is um, pretty useful. Obviously that uses the middle, your, your mouse wheel to zoom in and out so that's a pretty efficient way to zoom. Zoom clicked point to center. So I have that clicked on but I'll show you what that does. So basically that means that the zoom is always going to um, zoom into where your mouse is pointed. So if we're going to use the middle mouse or like not our middle mouse but our wheel and you could see that it's zooming into that area of where your mouse is at. So if we move it by his head, it's going to zoom towards the head, which I actually find this is very useful. Uh, enable flick panning. So another example of that, if we're zoomed in and we're going to pan, so you could kind of like almost do like a gesture of just kind of flick the zoom and then you'll see that it's kind of animated while it's doing that. Again, I find that pretty useful. It's a little more accurate to what you're looking at. So 
and then place or drag raster images as smart objects like depending on what you're doing um, this could be useful to to your workflow but uh, I'm not really going to get into that we could look at the tooltip really quick and um, basically what it says there is determines whether placing a raster image into a document will create a smart object this does not apply to something but um, it basically is just allows you to drag in a smart object so um, and that's about it for those options now we could talk about the history log really quick and all that that really does is allow you to log your actual history so your history here you'll be able to like save that out as a text file or like a file that has metadata or both and there's just different ways that you can log the items and it's useful for something I don't, I'm, you know I don't really use that too often but some people might for scripting or something like that so that's pretty much it for the general um, section of the preferences so moving on to the interface section of the preferences you have your standard screen mode and your colors here so let me shift this palette over here or this menu over and um, you can see the gray here is the color that's around your image or like your canvas so you could switch that from gray to black to a custom color custom color will be your uh, foreground color that is selected but let me show you something neat about this that you could change on the fly too um, if you grab your fill bucket and select a color then you can hold the shift down and click out there too and you could fill it with um, any color that you want just a little trick there some people know about it some people don't um, going back to the interface I'm just going to set that back to gray and then you see we have the line here which is your border you could switch that to a drop shadow so you can see over here it's this drop shadow now or line set them both to drop shadow and um, it's just a visual I don't know moving on show your channels in color so if you go to your channels tab click that and you'll see that your channels will switch to color show menu colors now this is um, an option for you to highlight menu items in the menus so but you have to have it enabled first or color set and the way that you set a color is you need to go into your edit menus and I'm not going to get in this too much because this is more into like interface customization but uh, this is just a way that you could turn this on so that setting works so if you could see here the application menu command visibility and color like all these have colors so you could set them to um, specific colors that you want to use so then with that option enabled um, which is show menu colors you'll see that in the menus here you'll now have a color set so it's useful for kind of visually organizing you know the things that you use the most or whatever um, but that's what that does show tooltips pretty straightforward that toggles on and off the tooltips um, like that one that just popped up there enable gestures allows you to use um, kind of touchpad gestures like on a Mac and uh, so that could be useful too if you're you know using your laptop or whatever so panels and documents auto collapse iconic panels are your, um, your little panels here that pop out so auto collapse will basically collapse them when you're not using them so for example um, if we click on this here and say you're doing some work and you go back to your image it automatically closes now depending on your workflow that might be a good thing or a bad thing but um, without it checked if you have it open it allows you to continue to work and keep that open open documents is tabs when you open a new document that is going to open it in a tab inside of one window so um, this is kind of like a new feature since I think CS4 and you can open multiple images in one window and allow you to, to sort of organize and toggle between them um, pretty easily it just depends on on how you want to work um, so let me close that going back into the options or my preferences so enable floating document window docking so that just will allow you to drag and, and 
dock things into other windows. So if you don't have the other settings set and it opens it in a window, you can drag it into and dock into the other window. So those preferences allow you to sort of mess with the, the panels and documents in Windows. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm still not 100% used to the documents as tabs, uh, but I'm getting a little bit used to it more. And uh, restore default workspaces. Basically click that and it's just going to you know reset your defaults. UI text options, you have UI language, English, and then your font size. Pretty straightforward. And that wraps up this section. Okay, now moving over to the file handling section, um, we have file saving options, which we have image previews always save, never save, mask when saving. So basically that's just a Photoshop default to say that every time you save an image in Photoshop, it's going to save a little thumbnail preview for your file within the operating system. So um, that's pretty much it there. It'll give you an icon, Windows thumbnail, um, append the file extension, so that's when um, Photoshop is naming the file for the operating system that it will either put a .psd or, or you know dot .whatever and so this is just a way for you to tell it what to do. So you could use a lowercase extension I think if it's turned off it's um, uppercase or you could say you don't even want an extension. So it's up to you. Um, camera raw preferences we won't get into that now because we'll talk about that stuff later in some of the raw features um, and raw import. So moving on from there we have um, camera for supported files. That stuff again we'll talk about later. Um, this stuff we'll talk about later but um, as for before saving layered TIFF files so it is possible in some file types to have more than one layer so a TIFF file is one of them so this is just a way to um, it's like a fail safe if you're gonna save out a TIFF file and you're gonna have layers in your actual PSD file it's just gonna warn you um, and say like, hey, you've got layers in this thing, do you want to actually save these into the TIFF file or flatten it? So that's just an option for you to check that out there. Uh, maximize PSD and PSB file compatibility. Ask, never and always. So that's just a way for um, Photoshop documents to be optimized across um, different versions of Photoshop and different applications that are made by Adobe as well. Adobe Drive, that is kind of like an asset management um, software but we're not really going to get into that stuff. Um, as for recent file list contains 10 files, so you could set this number to basically go whatever you want, I guess, but uh, 10 is good enough for that. So this is all memory performance of Photoshop, and you can see that there's memory usage, there's history and cache, there's scratch disks, and there's uh, GPU settings in the video card. So what's pretty helpful here is that in each one of these sections, when you mouse over these, you can see that down here there's a description for each one of these. Um, which is pretty cool and for some reason I don't know why this isn't handy through all of the different uh, preferences here but here you go they're in this in this tab but uh, memory usage for the most part um, Photoshop does some math under the hood to figure out how much um, memory that Photoshop is going to use and it maybe even takes in consideration your documents and stuff like that but for the most part um, it gives you some defaults or some suggestions and if you want more or less, you can kind of like drag. It's like, hey, I want this to use up all my my RAM for Photoshop or less or whatever. So um, I kind of leave it at the defaults. Just whatever it suggests seem to work for me. But um, I guess you could change that if you know that you're going to work on some larger files, um, maybe some really large print files with a lot of um, layers and stuff like that, and you know it's going to be huge, um, then you could adjust accordingly for that. Uh, the history and cache, so this basically has to do with your history. And um, you could change the history states, like how many you want in, in here to show up. Um, your cache levels, and so there's all these different new defaults that you could pop in. You could see that the cache levels change, and like your tile size. So um, basically you can read the description about more of that stuff there. I just kind of leave it at the default. I've never really had any problems with it, so um, I just leave it alone. As for the scratch disks, um, if you have other resources for um, for memory, you know, like another drive or whatever, you can go ahead and plug that in. Um, you don't have to, but it's kind of up to you. And if you, again, it's all depends on what you're working on and how much memory you need to allocate to Photoshop. As for the GPU settings, 
Um, we're just going to leave them at the basic right now. We'll talk about some of that stuff later when we get into the 3D stuff. So, but that's pretty much it for the performance tab. Okay, now moving on to the cursors. Now this is basically just cursors and icons inside of Photoshop that um, that you could see while you're painting and um, different tools and all that stuff. So you have your standard, which is basically it just gives you the icon of the tool that you're using. So if we jump out of here, and so if we see our brush, you can see it gives you the little brush icon, and um, you know the stamp or the actual whatever the actual icon is. So I find that pretty hard to use because it's not very precise. Um, so there is a precise one that you can use too, and you can see it's just kind of like a crosshair. So, um, you know, looking over here on the gray, you got your little crosshair, and sometimes this gets hard to see, and I do notice that they fix this with later versions in Photoshop CS, because before, if it was like 50% gray or anything like that, your uh, your cursor would totally disappear, and it was kind of, uh, kind of a pain. But uh, going back, we have cursors, and then normal brush tip, which gives you the actual size of your brush. So you can see here, there's the size of our brush. Oh, I'm using the clone stamp, so. And um, it's a little more precise because you can kind of see where you're working. And you know the size of your brush tip, so that's pretty helpful. So, and then there's brush full size, which basically gives you the exact size of the brush that you're working on. And um, that can get, you know, it's again, it's up to you if you want to look at that preference or not. So I tend to use the normal brush tip with the crosshair and brush tip or the crosshair with or show only crosshair while painting so um, that you won't see until you're painting. So right now it's off but when you start painting you see the cross it switches to the crosshair. So again it's up to you and what you like working with. So I'm going to keep this with the crosshair and the normal brush tip um, for now. And then the other cursors, so you have standard and precise. So standard just shows you the tool that you're working with, you know, the icon that's from the toolbox. Or precise, which is kind of like, you know, if you're grabbing a color, like it gives you the little precise um, cursor. So pretty straightforward there. And as far as brush preview, now this is, again, new with Photoshop CS5, I believe. Um, and it's along the lines with the the HUD, like the palette. So if we jump out of here really quick and we do Control and Alt, you'll see that you can grow the size and shrink the size of your brush by moving left and right. So it's a definitely a workflow improvement because it allows you to like kind of switch on the fly how big you want your brush to use rather than using um, you know the brackets to move through or um, or like a hotkey, like it's it's kind of gesture driven now. And if you want to change the hardness of the brush type, you do Control Alt and move it up and down. And so you could see, um, you could see it changing. Let me change my brush size to something larger so you could see it there. So you could see it there now, moving up. It's getting softer, getting harder, and so that's pretty useful. And I'll cover that again in the brushes section. But um, going back to the preferences like the brush preview that the color here this red is what controls that sort of template for your brush so if we change this to blue let's go out of here and then now it's blue okay and now going on to transparency and gamut so transparency settings are basically the settings that are displayed inside of the layers menu and how it represents layer transparency so um, if we just create a new layer here, we can see that in our layers we have layer 1, and you can see it's completely transparent, and so Photoshop represents that with like a grid. It's like a white and a gray grid um, to show that there is transparency on this layer. So if we go ahead and just, let's just paint something in really quick. Um, you'll see that in our little icon here that shows that our pixels that are solid and then our pixels that are transparent. So going back into our preferences, these are the colors that represent the transparency. So you could change these colors to anything that you want. 
and you can make yourself nauseous with colors like this and change your grid size so if we turn this off here you can see that it's representing transparency um, of this layer by those colors that we chose which that's kind of like totally gross I'm going to set these back to some defaults um, and then you could change the size of the grid too so you could see that these squares here are larger now so again it's just these are preferences this is for you to shine and just make Photoshop run the way that you want it to run so as, as far as the gamut warning I won't get into that really too much now but um, this is a way to represent that um, colors using CMYK or other color modes that um, colors get out of gamut or they can't be represented somehow so it's just you'll see that the the pixel colors were actually changed to a color that you choose so um, that's pretty much it for the transparency and gamut okay going on to units and rulers so basically this is the section of the preferences that talks about you know how Photoshop measures out um, the units and rulers within it so your units basically is either pixels inches centimeters and all that stuff um, your type is in points which I leave it as points because basically type is measured out in points and you could see on your um, your rulers here that these are being displayed in pixels right now and if we switch it to inches you could see that they switches to inches um, so on and so forth so sometimes I use inches if I'm doing some print work or whatever most of the time I use it as pixels and um, or I switch back and forth between those two and kind of that's about it so as far as column size like again these are just all measurements within Photoshop new document preset resolutions you know it's, it's, it's your presets there point and pika size like it's just I kind of just leave it as it is and I don't really get into that stuff unless I specifically need to do some precision stuff but uh, for the most part the defaults are cool again I just change the unit size depending on more, what I'm working on guides grids and slices so let me exit out of here really quick and turn on my grid and my guides so there's the grid which is a uh, control or command um, quote and then command colon or control colon turns on your guides so we'll go over that stuff again in some of the hotkeys but um, so you can see here like your guides are color so like my cyan ones are here you could switch that to whatever you like you got magenta or yellow and a bunch of different presets I'm just gonna leave mine at cyan and your lines you got dashed lines so you could see that it makes a dashed line I actually like that better because it's not quite as intrusive on your eye but um, and then you could set custom color if you want you know to whatever and smart guides same thing like you can change these to whatever you want basically it's all customization of the guides and grids so that's kind of up to you what you want to set however you want to work totally cool moving on to plugins so additional plugins folder this basically just allows Photoshop to recognize a folder that you choose when you're installing um, new plugins or if you want to keep plugins in a different folder um, other than the default ones that Photoshop uh, suggests so you would just turn this on and uh, navigate to the folder that you would like and where that's located at and then Photoshop will see those plugins and use them pretty straightforward extension panels so in CS4 and CS5 they have these new extension panels that you can turn on and uh, they connect to the internet and get information and data for you to use within Photoshop I'm not going to get into that now this will probably be covered in some of the interface stuff but uh, again these are just some preferences for you to set if you want Photoshop to connect to the internet for these extension panels if you actually want to load them or show CF, CS Live and application bar again that's up to you so the type options use smart quotes show Asian text options enable missing glyph protection show font names in English and font preview size so the ones that I've only really messed with here are probably the font preview size and um, I show an example there so you could set this small medium large so if we exit out of here and go to our type tool and you could see that here these are very small and this is basically the preference to set the size of these fonts that are displayed here so going back into the preferences again let's take a look at that and set it to huge which I'm sure is really cool so and here's huge 
which is helpful but if you got a pile of fonts installed and you're not managing properly like the way that I'm doing it right now um, you can see that it could be kind of cumbersome so I'm just gonna set that to um, medium and be done with it so moving on to 3d last but not least we'll take a look at um, the preferences for the 3d stuff now I'll talk about a lot of this stuff more in the 3D section, but uh, again, like there's these different sections and they give you a description because some of these preferences are a little more involved. Um, again, there's video RAM for 3D, which apparently Photoshop likes to hog it all, so that's what it's doing here. But again, you can kind of optimize and, and um, set this to your liking, depending on what you're working on. Interactive rendering, again, I'm not going to get into that stuff too much right now. We'll get into it in the 3D section. 3D overlays. Basically, these are just ways to display color um, for different elements in the 3D part. And so these are the defaults that are set. These are just color choices. So again, it's up to you to set these to whatever you would like. Ground plane, again, we'll get into this stuff later. But uh, that's pretty much it for the Photoshop preferences. And uh, I know this is probably not the most interesting part of the lecture, but um, you probably have picked up a few things inside here that are probably useful and hopefully with these preferences you'll uh, be up and running with Photoshop in no time.